Welcome to another episode of Get Your Fill, Financial Independence and Long Life, where we work on ways and discover new ways to achieve those two goals, and we invite our friends on to help us. And today, I am really excited to be joined by Dave Rowell. He is a former competitive physique athlete, as, as in the tradition of multi-hatted people that we like to have on the show. Dave is a former competitive physique athlete, turned serial entrepreneur, author, speaker, and leadership mentor. Uh, he has taken the path that a lot of us entrepreneurs have. He founded a growing, founded and grew a multi-million dollar online company, several multi-million dollar on, online companies in the field of health, fitness, and sports nutrition. Spent nearly a decade doing that and then saw the dark side of entrepreneurship as it gradually robbed him of his freedom, leaving him burned out and unfulfilled. And don't go there. Don't be like Dave. And he's going to tell, help us show us how we can avoid that same trap. He just refused to conform to that broken business culture um, that create, you know, that we know that promotes and rewards workaholism and nonstop hustle and created a sustainable structure and systems for his life and business to reclaim his freedom without sacrificing the growth of his companies. Um, he has a passion for entrepreneurship, which fueled his, so it feel, I'm going to edit that out. Fueled by his passion for entrepreneurship and human performance, he launched Epic. Now, I have you've, is Epic or Epic? Epic. Epic. Okay. Epic, an in innovative leadership development company that helps busy entrepreneurs maximize their impact and freedom. And we all want to maximize our impact and freedom. So he follows his efficiency first philosophy to entrepreneurial pro productivity and performance. And he developed a powerful methodology that he sums up in his best selling book, Done by Noon which we have right here, how to achieve Ooh. more by noon than other entrepreneurs in a full day and potentially even a full week, I think, looking at some of the things that we, you know, looking at the program and how much you can get done. Um, Epic systems, frameworks, and tools, including the Epic Planner, which we also have right here, uh, and are used by thousands of entrepreneurs all around the world. Epic has also built a fast-growing network like Epic Certified Partners, who teach the methodology on three continents. And I think the goal is five, right? Or six. <laughs> the goal is all of them all of them and antarctica of them. needs this darn it antarctica <laughs> needs it the penguins need it but we, you know what we're getting our first one in the caribbeans actually uh we enrolled the first one in the caribbeans this week so uh, it's congratulations. another territory where yeah it, it, it's great so english-speaking caribbeans and uh that's fantastic yeah it's fantastic growing. Mm -hmm. so dave thank you so much for being with us today i just i'm very excited to to uh free my life by le learning your systems in the next hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll do the best we can with the hour. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So the first thing I was hoping you could talk about is um, just a, like a broad overview, because I don't want to start in the middle since, you know, we, you and I both know something about the system. I don't want to start in the middle and, and, you know, fall into the curse of knowledge. And I want to just start at the beginning and give mm -hmm. people an idea of um, just, first of all, tell us, a little bit about your story and how you came to know that you needed to have this system. Yeah. yeah you know, it's, I think as an, I, I followed the classic path of, you know, entrepreneurship and uh, I feel like most of us who start a business, we start for that one thing that we all want, which is, which is freedom. And I, in the book, I divide freedom into three, three freedoms. So there's time freedom, you know, the, the ability to do things when we want, creative freedom. So basically to do, th to do what we want. So pretty much offer our, our creative solutions to the world and, and sell it, which leads to the third freedom, which is financial freedom. You know, we want to be well paid doing so. And um, I, in, so in 2007, I, 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 I came across the fascinating world of, of online marketing and building online businesses, which is, uh, you know, at the time was not like the norm. They were, I didn't know that many people who were working full time online and and doing that. And I made this guy named Lee Hayward, um, who was had been doing that since like the 1990s. He had the first bodybuilding website on the internet. And at that point, you know, I was a competitive athlete. I was competing in in bodybuilding. And um, he, when I met him, so I met him at that show uh, in real life. So we knew of each other from the local circuit, but we really met at that, that show we were both competing in. And he told me that he was making, you know, six figure income from his bodybuilding website. It's like, and he had been doing so for you know quite a while. So at that point I was like, I need, I need to figure out how he's doing that. And, uh, at this point, you know, I kind of traded my, 
my my passion for fitness to for an obsession to with with business and and building online businesses uh i went full time in 2009 uh with a business called the muscle cook so it's a business that it, it was a website it's it's still actually active but it's a website for um that provides recipes and 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 nutrition advice for uh, bodybuilders and people into fitness from there we had our first our first digital products so cookbooks for muscle building for fat loss and uh from there you know people were were seeing what i was doing and were like okay well you know i have this audience i'm doing these youtube videos youtube was starting to get hot at the times like but how, how do i make money with that so i i've built an agency to actually help these online coaches uh make more money online which i did for for a few years after that i had the opportunity to invest in a supplements company called bioptimizers so um it was interesting because it was more like a business turnaround that I did with that company, uh, sold, sold it in 2016. And, you know, from there, I had the opportunity to start coaching, uh, uh, coaching uh, entrepreneurs. They really wanted to do what I wanted to do back to, to the freedom. They really wanted that, that you know, same type of freedom. And, you know, um, what happened is that I had built systems around, you know, my life and business in order to keep that freedom. And I think I made the classic mistake of, what I call, you know, in the book, I, I call it drifting. It's, you know, the fact of gradually drifting away from the initial intent, drifting away from the fact that we all want freedom, but eventually we kind of get lost in that dark place that we don't recognize anymore. We don't know where we're at. And we looks like we've drifted so far away from the initial intent that we have to do things differently. We have to change the way we operate. And um, there's a lot of similarities between the world of entrepreneurship and the world of sports performance and the way you know entrepreneurs need to behave in order to be performance like you know we say the fact of going to the gym once doesn't make you an athlete well the fact of launching a business doesn't really make you an entrepreneur either you know you need to develop these habits you need to develop these systems and this i would say way of being and way of acting that will make you you know free and, you know, a lot of what we teach goes against, you know, the, what the culture tells you to do, which is a culture of, you know, always doing more, always hustling 24 seven. And we all fall for this trap. We all fall for it, you know, until like, I think someone, you know, we all work very, very hard until someone tells you, you need to work very, very smart. So you shift that way and you realize that that doesn't work either. And uh, we always talk about working right. You know, it's working appropriately for what you want to accomplish, what your goals are. And, and, and I've developed a system if you want, kind of a, I would say, kind of a, if, if you would tell me like, I want to lose body fat or I want to lose, build, you know, I want to build muscle. Well, I would build a program, you know, that would fit that, right? And that's what we offer with, uh, at Epic and, and with, uh, with it, what we talk about in Done by Noon. Yeah, it's, I, I, to bring that back, I actually one time saw a thing of how to do, uh, how to run a marathon. So mm -hmm. at the end of the year, you want to be able to run a marathon. And that means that today you have to run like, I don't know, a mile and a half or something. It was just a little tiny chunk of what you hope to accomplish by the end of the year. And that's what you're doing with the system, right? You've got this huge annual goal, and then you're bringing it into just like you would with a training regimen, you're bringing it into like, what do I need to do this afternoon or hopefully before noon <laughs> yeah. in order to make sure that I have that goal achieved by the end of the year? Yeah, no, exactly. You know, we, we, we go from a place where, you know, we take it from a place where you are probably misaligned right now. You have drifted in your business, in your life, and, and you want to realign. So the first step is, uh, the first step, of, so it's a four-step methodology. So the first step is to actually set a point of alignment. So the big, what we call the big picture, which is really understanding, you know, where you want to go and you visualizing that, you know, on the long term, what does it look like for you? Visualization is great because it allows you to paint a portrait of what you want, but, you know, the reality might be different. It's like, you know, you going on a trip, for example, you say you imagine in your head, you visualize what it looks like, but when you get there, it's different, but it's equally as pleasant, I would say, like it should be anyway, you know, as pleasant as you would think. So this is setting that. So it's not really setting goals, but mostly setting a big vision, which is kind of your North Star, which is your main point of alignment. And from there, you're going to start setting goals. So setting, I would say more than goals, it's 
outcomes, what results you want to see become a reality within the next 12 years. So we ask you to actually uh, curate your goals and have a list of five for the next 12 months. Uh, and based on that, we start reverse engineering what you need to do. So prioritizing, understanding, you know, okay, well, how do you invest your finite resources? How do you invest your time, your energy, your attention? And once you've assessed that, we show you how to prioritize your time, your energy, and your attention with the right tasks. And, and also uh, understanding the entrepreneurial landscape that there are things that you do as an entrepreneur that most you know, people will not do. You know, that types of tasks that an employee will not have, you know, and it's understanding that and understanding the specific context of entrepreneurship. From there, you have to plan, obviously. So when you understand what you need to prioritize, it's planning accordingly. So from there, we have, you know, a 90 day uh, framework that we use that allows you to, yes, set, you know, your your goals or your projects for the next 90 days, but also plan your weeks and your days accordingly and optimize, you know, with time. So there's a whole review system integrated that allows you to, um, you know, always review what went well, what went wrong and how you can improve. So you're always on that quest of, of self-leadership, you know, of being more self-aware, being more self-disciplined and, and respecting the process and, and the way you evolve within that process. And the last step, which is, I think this is the step that's missing from a lot of methodology is the protection step. So understanding that it's great to have a structure, but now what you really need is to protect that structure and prevent you from drifting. It's like, right, you know, driving on a highway, it's, it's really like safeguarding that highway. You know, you have these guardrails on the side that prevent you from, you know, going in the ditch and end up in a place you don't want to be in. So um, it's safe, really, yeah, safeguarding that journey and understanding that there's still room, you know, for uh, pivots or I would say freedom or, or freestyling. But the key is always to being able to bring it back to uh, and what you want and also being flexible, understanding that you know, what you want now might not be what you want a, a year, you know, next year. You don't know that. And it's part of the uncontrollable environment that the future is. And it's how well you adapt to it that will make you successful in the long term. Interesting. Yeah. Um, many things that you just said have triggered some questions and thoughts that I have. And the first one I want to ask is that you, you talked about self-awareness and the importance of self-awareness. What are some tools that people can use? Because I think we all think we know ourselves, yeah. but if we <laughs> but maybe we are not being hundred percent honest with ourselves. We just only see the, the, thing, the, fact, the uh, skills or the qualities that we would like to have and may or not may or may not actually have those <laughs> yeah you know it, it's interesting i feel like uh, self-awareness is a never-ending quest you know and and you're right there's one thing that i think what we talk about in the book it's, it's ambition appropriation meaning that we will um embody some and um, some ambitions that are not ours because we see someone do that or we see someone do this or i need to have this or if i want to be perceived as successful i need this and i need that and these are not necessarily things that we want you know for example it's like having a nice car for example not everybody cares about a car but if you want to show that you're successful you need that nice car and i'm like and i always like you know you everybody's going to battle with that it's like okay why Yes, I need to show that because it's going to show status, but that doesn't really mean that I value that. I just need four wheels to get me to point A to point B, which is my case. And I, and I had to make that decision, you know, these adjustments of knowing that and understanding how being, you know, respecting that. I feel like sometimes, you know, we talk about self-respect and self-awareness is part of what I call self-leadership. It's the ability to, to lead yourself. And, you know, there's the self-discipline piece, the self you know, uh, awareness piece, but a self-respect, you know, piece and respecting what our ambitions are, what we want, what we truly want and why we want them, you know? And I feel like we see people having huge ambitions and that's great. And I'm not saying like that you should not have them, you know, but they need to be true to what you really want. Some people are, I think we, we glorify this and we don't glorify enough, for example, the small businesses, the people who really want to have a very targeted impact on a very specific niche and they want to do it, you know, making 
hundred thousand dollars a year. And that's perfectly fine for them, you know, and, but they're going to be able to create their best work. They're going to have their best impact accordingly. So there's both ways. You just need to understand what, what floats your boat, you know, and understanding that. Yeah. And be honest, like you say, it's oh, it be challenging to be honest with yourself. <laughs> but, but I mean, and you know what, like, if you're not honest, it's going to show uh, after a while, like, you know, you're going to start being misaligned with, with what you really want. And that misalignment will translate into, you know, probably frustration, stress, burnout, uh, you know, drifting really like that's what drift will, will, will bring in your yeah. life. So you will, you will be able to, sometimes you realize it, but it's too late, not too late, but it's, it's late in the process where if you have frequent points of alignment, that's why like you, you can prevent that. That's why we're like hey, every week, Let's let's have a review of your week, you know, like see what went well, review your, you know, review your annual guideline, review your plan for the next 90 days, see, celebrate the victories, look at to what didn't go as well, uh, have a self-awareness check, uh, you know, check up and, and, on, and see how you can improve. You know, it's like little improvements gradually that will compound and, 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 you know, bring you back on, on the track to, to what you truly want, you know, your, your true success. And those are some things that you might do if you had a team, but be, with, with these tools that you've developed, you can, you can do it yourself. You can do it as, yeah. as a solopreneur because you've, you have cataloged what you were going to do. You have your, you know, I mean, a lot of us have less of a goal list and more of a to-do list, mm -hmm. right? And it just ends up yeah. checking a lot of boxes and, oh, that felt good. I just did the laundry, you know, <laughs> that was not going to get you closer to your goal. Right. But it, it is it, that process of, of, um, checking back in and verifying that you're on target and, and seeing how you did and, and all that, like I said, that you might sit around and do with your team if you had a team of people, but, but now you can do it very successfully just, just on your own. Yeah. Um, so tell me about the ignorance zone. <laughs> do you want to get there? <laughs> get out no. of the ignorance zone. <laughs> yeah, you know, we, we, we talk about a, a lot about, you know, the drift and how it happens and, and the different zones that you will, eventually be in in your entrepreneurial life and so the, the, the core think about it like your your superpower is the center of it the thing that you do the absolute best there's usually like one or two things and some things we don't even realize that's our superpowers because it comes easy and we didn't re we don't we think it's easy for everybody and it's not you know it's and it's realizing what it is but you know that's that there's your superpower at the center of it and you have that what I call power zone around it, which is things you do really well, better than most people, which is not necessarily the one thing, but it's, an, it, it's, it's a, select, sele, so selected amount or number of things that you do way better than most people. So the problem is that this is the zone that we usually start with as an entrepreneur because we attach our products, our service based on these things that we do well naturally. And we can solve, you know, the problem, people's problems with, with our, our, our products or our services. But as, as business grows and as business evolves, well, you start drifting away from that. So now you go through, you know, your average zone and your sub subpar zone and your, um, and your ignorance zone, which you don't want to be in because more than often we're going to say, oh, I need to get better at that. And we're going to pick the thing that we totally suck at. And we're like, okay, well, I need to get better at that. But the problem is that you neglect your power zone, right? And eventually what you used to do really well or what brought you success, like is not being taken care of. So you start wandering on all, in all these zones that other people, whether other people or, you know, robots, for example, can take care of, you know, there's so many automation tools that you can use. Like you can outsource, you can delegate these tasks that are going to be done in a way better fashion. That doesn't mean you should not improve yourself on, on some weaknesses, but I mean, it should never be at the, the expense of what you do truly great, right? I would rather double down on what I do great rather than trying to always compensate for my weaknesses because my weaknesses are someone else's superpower. And um, yeah, so, and with every single, I would say, um, zone, you have what we call a drifting coefficient, which is it takes a lot of money and energy to be in these zones right? What you do effortlessly, like what you absolutely suck at, it's going to take, it's going to have a cost. So there's a cost of venturing. We, we call that you know, the drifting cost. And we have a little formula in the book that we actually to put a dollar value to it, because it's not something that we realize, but what 
when we put a dollar value to it, it's like, oh, okay, now I get it. It's costing me. There's an opportunity cost there. And uh, also the thing that is not always as easy to scale, to understand or to, to measure is the amount of energy it's going to take you. Like it, it exponential. And, and yeah, so obviously like venturing outside of your power zone is a strategic mistake on the long term. Uh, and not realizing you're outside of your power zone is even a greater mistake. So um, it's understanding that. And once you do, well, it, it changes, you know, the game for, uh, for you and your business. Yeah. yeah and, and that's our, that's our inclination, right? We think, oh, I'm not that strong in this field. I better get better at, you know, bookkeeping. <laughs> Right. I better get better because I really just don't know what's happening with my finances. I better get better with my bookkeeping and, and instead, <laughs> right. It, and then you, you wind up, you're not doing what you're good at. Like you say, I mean, I was a decision I made with the podcast early on. I said, I'm not going to edit this podcast. <laughs> this is going to take me longer to edit it than it takes me to, you know, do anything else. Right. I'd much rather put that time and effort into something that I enjoy. And I I'm assuming that that's one of the reasons that we get burnt out because we're not doing the stuff that comes easily and fun and that supercharges us. We're doing the stuff that we hate to do and we suck at. And, and that's why we're like, being you know, charged. this is so it's, thing. it's, it's not great, what I thought, right? Yeah, it's a great word. You know, you're not being charged, but also the energy you're spending on these things is just tremendous. And this is why, like, there's a cost of misalignment. Like, your body will feel it. Like you will not be fulfilled by doing these things. Again, that doesn't mean you should not self-improve. On the, on, you should always seek self-improvement, but it doesn't mean that you need to do all the things well, you know? And I use the, I use the example of accounting in the book because, I mean, or bookkeeping, because yeah, it's the, the one thing that 99% of creative entrepreneurs are absolutely terrible with. You know, they're not good with numbers and, guess what? There are some people that are really, really good at that and that you should absolutely listen. So this way, when you free your, I would say it's like a computer, right? Like the RAM on your computer, when you free some RAM and you have more RAM available for the things you do well, this is how you move the needle in the business and, and really get, you know, see the results that you want. I agree. I think you want to know enough to be able to supervise the person yeah. who's going to actually do the work, right? <laughs> Well, you're not going to be supervising the person. You're just going to be under. Go, yeah. You're going to be to able hire to the right person. Enough, enough, the, enough yeah. of their language. You know, right. you're going to you're going to speak some of their language enough to have a conversation. But this person is going to be very, very fluent in that language, and you know, knows words that you don't know. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> and that's the way I think of it. Like even having work done on my house, right? I I suppose I could do some of this work, yeah. but it is going to just take me forever. It's not going to come out that yeah. great, but if I understand enough about what needs to be done to communicate mm -hmm. with that person, to properly delegate to them, then things just flow. But that's a perfect analogy, you know, to the house. You know what you want your house to look like. You just don't know how to pass electrical wires and, you know, <laughs> do any like, you know, mud work on your uh, sheetrock and stuff like that. Yeah, but Dave, there's a YouTube video, so I can teach myself, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we, we always think that, but then you, you see the end result. You're like, yeah, I should have hired this guy because I, it actually costed me more money to do that than, you know, hiring someone in the first place, right? Exactly. So, and it but took you, six months. You don't, but if you don't have the money, you will have to you know, do things yourself and that's fine. But realize that if you have never built a house before, doing that all by yourself will take you a long, long time and the result might not be what you look for. Yeah, that might be as good as you, it's going to get. But if you had looked into the part that you really suck at, for example, like I did that with my house, you know, I, I technically contracted my old house. But for example, rule, I never touch electrical. I don't touch electrical because I have no idea what I'm doing and I might end up <laughs> dead if I do. Right. So that's the ignoring zone. And it's understanding that. And I'm going to hire someone to do it. Um, and, and yeah. And then from there, you reverse engineer. You're like, okay, well. This is the thing I suck the most at. Now let's look into the second thing that I suck the most at, you know, and, and, and you, you go by elimination. Yeah. But now you said that I, if you don't have the money, but the problem is, right, if I spend all my time doing these things that I don't have the money to outsource, mm -hmm. then I'm never going to make more money, right? I'm never going to be able to dip into my superpower and get to the point where I get the critical mass to have the money to have someone else do whatever it is that needs to be done. 
right? And it's 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 a balance. It's like it's it's reinvestment. I think this is also part of the of being an entrepreneur. It's like you're gonna learn to reinvest in your business. So identify that the first round of profits, you know, you keep a little bit for yourself, you're spending on improving the system. And it it comes gradual, you know, no one does it alone. And you have to, you know, that's a big mistake to just make some money and take it all for yourself and, <laughs> and think that your business is going to be all right. You know, you have to reinvest, you know, in that. And that investment, you know, we're, we, we put money in the bank. We put money in the bank. So it makes, you know, it's into savings account or other investments. So it makes, you know, it has interest and makes interest. And yeah. you, you earn that money, that passive income. Well, guess what? If you had put that money in your business, trust me, you're going to make more and you're going to make more. And, yeah. you know, these are... This is how you build real passive income. You know, there's yeah, no definitely. tricks to it. It's so tell me about load management and how that relates to how that takes comes from the athletic realm and comes back to entrepreneurship. Yeah. So I love load management because it's a concept that, you know, in, in, in sports science that is well known in sports science, but not well known to the public. And in the book, I use the example of Kawhi Leonard, who uh, actually, who was a member of the, the championship uh, Toronto Raptors and the ones who brought back, you know, the first, um, the, the first big title in, in 25, in Canada, in 25 years, major sports title in Canada, right? The, the last ones were my beloved Montreal Canadians in 1993. I know you're in Boston, but I love the rival. <laughs> it's, it's funny here because I live in New Brunswick, Canada. And um, fr the French speaking population is very, very into the Montreal Canadiens and the English speaking population is Boston Bruins fans because that's the closest, those are the two closest cities. We're actually closer to Bo from Boston than we are from, you know, Montreal. And so there's that big rivalry always between Boston and Montreal, but that's the um, kind of thing can tear a city apart. You gotta be uh, careful. <laughs> yeah. Especially in Boston. <laughs> you don't show up in Boston in a Montreal Canadians Jersey, no, unless you want to get sure. in a fight and that's fine. <laughs> or, you know? or the Mets, or the New York Mets either. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. The and they, they oh my gosh. Yeah. But you know, yeah. So you know, back to the, the, the sports analogy. Um, so Kawhi Leonard, when he got so he got traded to the Toronto Raptors the year before and that the year so he got traded when he got traded the year before he had played I think nine games because he was it was injured so he was like labeled as that injury prone guy and that year where when he played for the Toronto Raptors he was on what we call a load management plan so basically he was not playing all the games so he was never playing all the back-to-back -back games and he was on the very strict regimen in order to control the amount of demand that was put on his on his body but what happens and it was exactly like you know what we talked in the entrepreneurial culture is that because he was sitting out of games and not playing back-to-backs or he was you know, not playing every game he was labeled as you know the lazy player the player who was always injured the player who was not a team player the player who did not have that dedication to the game you know he was labeled multiple you had multiple labels that year because they didn't understand load management and load management was heavily criticized that year. I was like, you guys will understand. You guys will understand what it's all about. And in the playoffs, you know, Kawhi came out as an absolute beast. You know, he came very, very close from breaking the total points, re total point record of, of Michael Jordan. I mean, and he brought that team to a championship and the reason, and I was like, and I was so happy when they did, not just because I'm Canadian and I, I obviously am a big fan <laughs> trophies in our country but um that he proved the point you have to carry appropriately you will shine in the best moments in the moments that matter right so it all comes down to managing your time your energy and your attention and basically like he proved the whole, the whole point. So that, uh, that approach or that sports performance technique, we apply it to entrepreneurship. So um, at Epic, what we do is one part of the methodology is understanding your workload, understanding how much work you have to carry every day, what this work is made of, and understanding how much you can carry, you know, sustainably. So that doesn't mean that because you cannot carry a lot of a big workload now, that you will not going to be able to carry a bit heavier workload later. 
that's what we call also the principle of adaptation is that, you know, you you will start going to the gym, Chris, and you will be, you know, starting with weights that you think you can lift. And then you're going to get under the bar and you're going to start pressing. And you're like, that's a lot heavier than I thought. Maybe I should look at, you know, set more modest goals, learn how to, you know, perform this move and lift this weight properly. And when I do, I'm going to start gradually increase. So you're going to increase, you know, you're going to put two, you know, a 10 pound, uh, a 10 pound plate on each side. And then you're going to start, you know, lifting more and more weights. And over the course of a year, you're going to be like, oh my God, like I'm lifting that much weight. And I started there. But it's the same thing with your work. I think if you don't learn how to work, if you don't learn how to perform, you know, your, your work with gradual increase, like gradual improvements, but also controlling the workload, understanding that there will be days where you're not going to be able to work, you know, heavy, that every single day, you're not going to be able to do your one rep max, that every single day you will have to include some uh, rest and recovery within that. This is when you start, you know, we talked about self-awareness, but that's a process of self-awareness. That's a process of being a better self-eater because you build that discipline to get better. You build that self-awareness of understanding how much workload, how much load you can carry. And, um, and also, you know, respecting that, right? Understanding, hey, I might have some, you know, some people might be very, you know, good at lifting a lot of weight. Some people might not, but it's part of the process of becoming an entrepreneur. And we use that analogy with the big rocks, the small rocks, and the sand to uh, illustrate, you know, how to break down your workload. Uh, and you have to fill your buckets and say every, every quarter you have to carry buckets. And you might not be able, you know, the big mistake that we see a lot of people do is that they're going to fill three full buckets in their first quarter. They're going to use the methodology and realize like, that's actually pretty heavy to carry. Maybe next quarter, I'm going to do two buckets and go from there. And you're going to adjust. And that's the beauty of it because it allows you to actually track your results and allows you to track how you, how you perform, you know, how you can manage that load. And that's why like the whole load management principles in self in sports performance really apply to entrepreneurship and, and what we do. And we think that if we can just, I mean, instead of saying, oh, this is too heavy for me, a lot of times we might just say, I just, I have to do this. You know, I have to stay up till midnight to do this work. And I have to, you know, stand here until I can lift this thing to my chest. And then you yeah. end up with an injury or you end up burnt out and you can't perform. The burnout, the burnout is, is, is the entrepreneur, the entrepreneur's injury. You know, this is how it materializes, you know, and, you know, there could be different symptoms, but it's like, hey, if you tear ligament well you know you will have inflammation you have different things that will happen but guess what it can take sometimes and with all oh, it's nothing i'm going to apply some cream on it and i'm going to be fine next thing you know the rehab is actually longer than you thought because you worked on that injury too much and you broke things that are hard to you know rebuild same thing you know it's, it's the same thing with your body and or, or your brain you know i think entrepreneurs work with their brains quite a bit uh and that, that's what you need to take more of you know take care of obviously it's a holistic thing but you know, it, this, the analogy is very similar. Yeah. And you talked about the sand and that, and that the way I re relate that in entrepreneur land is the busy work, the things that we think mm -hmm. we have to do just so that we're, you know, running around to a lot, you know, you think when, what are you actually doing? Is this actually valuable? But there's a certain, I, I want to say, and maybe this is just my history, but I want to say there's a certain amount of guilt associated with uh, not running around all the time. <laughs> right? You feel yes. like I'm not doing the most for my, you feel like I'm not doing them. I'm not do, serving my company well, yeah. if I'm taking off early. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's this huge element of guilt that goes with it, you know, of not playing, you know, it's understanding what game you want to play. You know, it's understanding what game you want to play at what level you want to play and what level you can play it. And, you know, I, I, I see, I, you know, you look at hockey, for example, look at all the coaches, for example, they were not necessarily the best players. There are a lot of them were fort liners or goons, or, you know, but they understood the, like, how to work hard, how to work smart also to make the team. And they have incorporated, they don't they have a way better view of the game, you know, and how it's played. And then they adapted the game to their capacities. 
But that doesn't mean they don't have a love for the game. They have the most love for the game because then they realize that the biggest impact that it can have for the game is actually to coach and, on, and make players understand you know, the game better. And it's not about, you know, for example, your success or your impact will not necessarily come in the form of dollars. They might come into different forms and understanding what type of player you are and how you can make the most out of it for, you know, within the game, you know, and maybe your role that you thought would be, well, guess what? It might not be, uh, it might not be what it is now, you know, so what do you think now? So that's why, like, again, self-awareness is so important and, and also being, respecting that, you know. Sorry, hold on a second. Suddenly, every dirt bike rider in the country is out. <laughs> I don't know if you can hear that with this microphone, but I like I keep hearing, there's uh, ambulances and dirt bike riders. <laughs> there you go. Well, you know, the, 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 you know the fact that dirt bikes are out. It's a good sign. That means you know sign. spring. Spring's spring coming. Is coming exactly. There you go. <laughs> so we've touched on this a few times, but we haven't actually brought it out into the light. And I, I want to talk a little bit about personal fulfillment and that's a big theme of your of your work i want you to just sort of like what does that mean to you what does that mean to other to other entrepreneurs yeah you know it, it i i feel like this is you know as much as we want freedom i think the greatest things that we want is really fulfillment you know and i think you know that is one thing that i talk about the book in the book is the entrepreneurial midlife crisis at one point Every, and every single entrepreneur will rethink sometime, you know, maybe not just once, but multiple times in their career, what they are doing. You know, I have, and it comes with the fact with experience because more than often, like you have been, let's say you could be a young entrepreneur, but having been played the game for, you know, quite a while, I mean, like, is this really what I want? You know, am I fulfilling my destiny? Am I, fu am I fulfilled by what I do? You know, is it my true purpose? And I feel like it's a constant, it's like self-awareness, right? It's a constant quest. And, and it's a healthy conversation to have. You know, it doesn't mean that you need, and the big mistake that most entrepreneurs make is that they, they will tear down what they've built before and build something brand new, you know? And I feel like what you've done so far brought you here. You might have to do things a little bit differently. That doesn't mean you need to tear down what you've built. That means you need to, you know, understand what really makes you fulfill what really makes you happy what really makes you you know that, that has that you know that fire inside and it will change over time that's a certainty you know nothing stays the same you know I, I look at my passion for bodybuilding for example I was apt Chris I was absolutely obsessed with the sport I was obsessed with it it was an actual total obsession extreme obsession and never ever I ever thought that that obsession would go away because when you're in there, I was like, that will never happen. And guess what? My, I, as I said, I traded my obsession for like my passion for another obsession and that became entrepreneurship. And I was like, oh, and I made perils. Like what, guess what? If I hadn't done that, I would not have been there. So it's understanding that as part of the journey, you will have different phases, but there's going to be a transition between phases. That doesn't mean that they, you know, the dots will connect when you get there, but you need that time and that respect for yourself to looking at what truly makes you fulfilled, right? And at one point, you could be, hey, I've been running that great business for a long time. It's making a lot of money, but I realize I'm not spending enough time with my kids. Hey, that's, you know, it's a good realization to have. It's like, okay, well, why do you want to spend more time with your kids? And some people, I think, like, that's the thing with kids. And that's an uncomfortable, like, conversation for a lot of people because I feel like a lot of people generally want to have more time, you know, with their kids. I think a lot of entrepreneurs also want time with their kids, but also because they feel guilty that they don't spend enough time with their kids, but also they don't want it to be a detriment of their creative capacity. So I think the main things that I see are the, the common denominator between entrepreneurs is losing their ability to create. Once you lose that, it's like a little piece of your soul that is being, you know, suppressed or, you know, taken away. And once you understand like that creative process or that it's a fuel for a lot of entrepreneurs, 
and when you incorporate that back into into your life you see things from a different perspective so never we're going to always look at things from a time and dollar perspective and that's why like the, i talked about the three freedoms you know time money but also uh creative freedom and i think this is the kind of the one we disregard at first but this is the one we're always going to come back to at one point because it's it's really i think what it's in the dna of entrepreneurs to create that's it and it's funny because you think like i get my best ideas when i'm on vacation mm -hmm. because i'm not hammering at it right i'm not i'm removed from the day to day and that's when you know the creativity can come through and i would think playing i don't have children but i would think playing with your kids could potentially be the same thing where you just yeah. you're removed from the from thinking about your business and your brain can keep doing its thing and all of a sudden it's going to spit out something that you didn't even know you were thinking about yeah it, it's it's hard to build that harmony you know and because we're in a society that also values work life balance and i, I don't I really don't like work that that term work life balance because that means that work is competing with life and that these are two contradictory, uh, you know, opposite forces that compete against each other. And I don't like that. You know, I think as an entrepreneur, your work is, your work is a very big part of your identity. It's a very big part of who you are, your life, you know, and, you know, I say that because I'm, I'm a dad, I have two young daughters and I, I take a lot of pride and a lot of my identity is actually being a dad. If you listen to the Done by Noon podcast with Chris Lopez, who has actually five kids, you know, we always talk about that stuff because that's a big part of our identity. But also my identity as a creator, as an entrepreneur, as a creative, or I call that, you know, practical artist, it's very, very, very ingrained. So I need to have that, that harmony. They're not two competing forces. It's just the fact that I have to find, to put the right systems and the right structure in place and apply the right leverage in order to create that, that harmony. You know, it's like the yin and the yang. There's a little bit of each in both. It's just how the dance works. You know, sometimes it's like dancing partners. You know, sometimes one partner would take the lead and some other times the other partner will take the lead. And it's how well, you know, they create that. And you don't, it's, you don't even see it. You don't, you barely see it. It's so beautiful that you don't really see it. And that's what you should strive for and not look at it as it's, a, you know, one is bad, one is good. You know, it, it's not how it works. Yeah. And the two are not competing with each other. Like you say, you can, you can blend them together too. you know, make that. But the truth is they're always blended. Like the truth is like life and business for an entrepreneur is always blended. And, you know, the, the concept of work-life balance might be relevant in, like, as an employee, for example, where you don't have control, but not for entrepreneurship. And I'll, I'll make the distinction between, you know, business owners and entrepreneurs. I think entrepreneurs are all business owners, but for some business owners, like that entrepreneur, they have entrepreneurial tendencies, but are not necessarily like entrepreneurs, you know, it's like some people can might go to the gym and always go to the gym and follow like specific, you know, specific workouts and everything, but they don't have that drive to go further. They don't have that athletic, you know, um, I would say predisposition to push themselves to the next level, which, is, and that's fine. You know, I think we, everybody, you know, under the sun now wants to become an entrepreneur before actually having achieved anything. And I'm like, it's not a badge of honor. Like un being an entrepreneur, it's just a way of being, just like being a bodybuilder is a way of being, just like being any kind of athlete, you know, is. And that comes with the ethos, that comes with everything that, you know, goes with it. But it's understanding how to play the game and how you want to play it. I think being an entrepreneur is also a way of thinking, mm -hmm. a way of thinking about things and a way of approaching problems and like, it's not just working for yourself. That's different, yeah. right? Yeah. Working for yourself is working for yourself. That's great. You have your own business, but you're right. Being an entrepreneur is, it's, it's a different kind of, in my opinion, it's a different kind of mindset, a different kind of way of approaching life and problems and all that. Yeah. hundred percent. And you know, there's some people who manage very, very, very lucrative businesses that in my opinion are not, don't have that much of an entrepreneurial mindset. Yeah. And that's fine. That doesn't mean that it's yeah. bad. And, and that, that's another thing with the culture is that we glorify the 
title of entrepreneur so much that you know, we, we, we make it like, oh, it's the thing to do. Well, it's, it's not. It might be the cool thing now, but I don't know about you, Chris, but I never called myself entrepreneur when I started. For me, it's like, it, it's a word that I started using like when it actually became more and more popular to call the type of people that, you know, we serve or we are, but I never called myself that. For me, it was like, hey, you know, I'm a dude with a website who runs a business that does that. And this is how we provide value. But there was not part of the lingo. I, I had to start calling myself an entrepreneur when I, the and, list became too long. And right? for me, I understood that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, it, it be, oh, you're frozen right there. Are you still there? Uh, yeah okay but, you you were frozen for yeah it's for a minute, getting a little it got second. a little hokey there for a minute but but sorry. you know yeah being an entrepreneur is that oh yeah we are, there you go but i think or are we back in sync oh hold on i, I can't think so yeah oh there you go there you go you're back <laughs> um but yeah you know it, it it doesn't have to be that complicated you know i feel like entrepreneurs you know are born with a specific dna or predisposition but it's like being an athlete. You can be born with some talent. If you don't know how to harness that talent, that doesn't mean you're going to make it to the big leagues. Well, the same thing here, you know, the better you learn. And that doesn't mean that even if you have talent that you want to play in the big leagues and that, and some people with less talent really, really want to play in the big leagues and it's fine. You know, like there's different combos, there's different contexts, there's different realities. And I feel like we're trying to put people in a box too much and, you know, where it's a little bit more complex than that. It's a little bit more contextual, I would say. True. That's true. I, I want to, I mean, I feel like we're running out of time and there's so much I want to talk to you about. <laughs> so I'm just going to deviate for a second to talk about my personal experience with using the planner, because what I found, right. So you, you, you find your six big goals for the year. And then you start to break them down into smaller pieces and smaller bite-sized pieces. And what I discovered is that my, my things, my big things didn't have um, enough. They didn't really have any steps or enough steps. And I said, you know, these are not big enough. These, these, you know, these, these goals, these pieces that I've just, that I've put out there as like annual goals, they're not big enough because there aren't enough chunks. Um, <laughs> Right. So I, so that made me kind of go back and rethink. And it's very powerful to, to kind of go back and say, all right, like this is actually a, this is, should be a, a medium sized rock. And, the, and there's a bigger piece that needs to sit above this. That is really not, that hasn't been articulated yet. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I, I think one of the mistakes that a lot of people do when you know, crafting their annual guideline is that they think they will all be projects. So rather than outcomes. So what I, what we really want people to understand is that when you make your, your goals for a year, don't make it as just one project. Think about the result of that project. Think about what this project or what maybe the collection of projects or the series of projects you're going to have this year will bring as far as results. So for example, like your annual guideline could be, I want to make hundred thousand dollars this year. I want to pay myself hundred thousand dollars this year. Well, the key now to set up your goals or your projects every quarter is like, is working on this going to contribute to make, you know, hundred thousand dollars this year, right? So sometimes this is how alignment works is that if you do something that's totally relevant and that will not bring this result or contribute this result, well, guess what? might not be the right choice of, of projects, right? So it's kind of a filter and it's understanding that, yeah, that annual guideline or the elements within this annual guideline are not necessarily projects. They're really things you or outcomes, uh, results you want to see become a reality and try to be specific, you know, like what number, like how much money, how many clients do you want to have? Uh, how many hours or how many weeks of vacation you want to take you know it, it could be what, whatever it is whatever floats your boat whatever your goals are yeah. it's just like you setting up these alignments that are or these goals for the next year and now the the main i would say the main uh challenge is to understand here are the three 
projects or the three main things or the three buckets that I'm going to carry for the next 90 days that are aligned with my annual guideline with what I want to see become a reality within the next 12 months. And then, you know, working your load management from there. Yeah. you know, and, and moving forward, moving forward. And, you know, and things change too. The, the goals you might set for yourself now, you might have to realign them, you know, in three months, six months, whenever you, we, we ask you to actually reevaluate your annual guideline every quarter. Yeah. And, and this is how you, you align, you know, it's okay. You will pivot, you will drift. We all do that. You know, the key of true alignment and true fulfillment is the frequency of which we're going to align. And sometimes you, you, you set, you know, a vision or destination, you know, I would say like, I picture that as a mountain and maybe that's not actually that peak that you want to be on. It's maybe the one next to it. And it's fine. You might just have to pivot a little bit yeah. that, but that, that's what it is. You know, the problem is that we're so, so attached to things that are out of context sometimes that are good now, but might not be relevant in 180 days from now, you know, that we, that's, that's another sign of not being aligned because we're aligned with the wrong, the wrong things, you know? Yeah. Well, like just as an example, one of my things was, you know, record an audio book for my book, you know, I was going to record it. Mm -hmm. And then I said, you know, I just have like two tasks on this thing. <laughs> like, why don't you just do it? <laughs> Get it. I said, you can have it done this afternoon. What the hell are you doing? You know, it's just like, this has to be part of a bigger thing a bigger strategy right and it really is like in my mind but i hadn't articulated it i hadn't put it down so it was getting lost in the task list instead of being a nice big grand vision of, of you know increasing the increasing the uh, readership of the book and you know increasing the what i want to say the reach basically yeah. the reach and things well, like that to, yeah because re writing the book is one thing you know having one book written is one thing now like having a ten thousand people reading the book is another objective, yeah. right? So what we say is like, well, or you could be having 10,000 people read the book. Well, guess what? Is it, can you do it in one year or not? You right. know, and, and it could be two different things. And, but to do that, it needs to become project. So if your annual guy in your annual guidance is, is having 10,000 people read my book, well, guess what? You, you I, I would bet that a lot of your projects or your buckets will be related to marketing. Yeah. sales and marketing, you know, going on show on podcast, you know, promoting, having Facebook ad campaigns, you know, building a sales funnel. I mean, there's so many, many things that you're going to have to do in order to, for that to, to be achieved. Right. So um, it's, it's thinking that way, like the critical thinking of what needs to be done in order for this to happen. Right. Exactly. And I was thinking of it backwards, you know, if mm -hmm. I do this, then this will happen instead yeah. of thinking, I want this to happen and this is what I need to do. And that's, yeah. You know, one of the one of the powers of the planner is that it did force me to shift my thinking, and so it's fantastic. So we're almost out of time, Dave. I it just the hours just flown by. It's been so great talking to you. Um, first of all, is there anything that you wish I would have asked you that I did not ask you? No, I really enjoyed that conversation. You me know, too. this is, I think we could talk for hours about it, obviously. <laughs> but you know, if you're if you're interested of knowing more, we have you know the book. Uh, we're having actually free copies to to your audience, so you can take a look at the show notes, and they're gonna have a special link. And um, and yeah, you know, we we summarize that, and then we have the yeah, obviously, as you said, the Epic Planner that you use, which is kind of the made for the brain of entrepreneurs, like the way we we see the world and and the way we operate. Uh, it's, it's really made to, you know, bring the most out of you. So it's all condensed, everything you're going to learn in the book. It's all condensed in the summarized in the planner and it's the tool really to, to thrive daily as an entrepreneur. Yeah, it's wonderful. I think, you know, just to reiterate what Dave just said in the show notes, you'll find a link to go and get a free copy of the book done by noon, which is just a fantastic book. It's really going to help you to sh think of your business and your life a little bit differently. And so much more about you're going to find yourself prioritizing the right things and getting rid of a lot of mm -hmm. BS that you didn't <laughs> know you even were dealing with every day. Right. And really to, to focus on the tasks that are going to make the money that are going to change your life. Mm -hmm. And that are going to, you know, just skyrocket your business. And just in closing, Dave, would you share with us your big picture? Oh my God. The concept so, of the big picture and then yours. Would you share? Yeah, mine. If yeah, you're comfortable so, with that, I know it's really personal. Oh, I, I can. I, I can give you the big lines of, of my big picture. Um, but for me, it has a lot to do with community and the way I see 
like really helping entrepreneurs use their superpowers more to create greater solutions. I had that dream of, of creating entrepreneurial communities where there's that group of entrepreneurs who work really hard to solve their um, communities problems or the, the problems they see in the world. And I have that vision, you know, of, of like, I'm, I'm living on an island and the community is on the mainland and, you know, and it's weird because that's the way I word it and that's the way I picture it. And this year, for example, I, I, I look back on my, so that's an exercise that I do every year. And I look back on my big picture and I was like, you know, there's elements of it that it doesn't, ex like I said, with the trip, like it doesn't actually look like that, but there's a start to this great vision right now. Like, for example, we've set up here like a structure like locally. So I live in a, in a rural area. It's 60,000 people in the whole peninsula here. Um, it's multiple little you know, towns. And we have, we really want to encourage collaboration and build that entrepreneurial mindset within small communities so that entrepreneurs can take take responsibility of their responsibility of their communities not just wait for governments to offer you know uh financial or even creative solutions to to the problems or to the resources and and, and how to help you know rural areas like ours thrive and we have set up that small group uh of entrepreneurs here locally and i i lead that in it's a nonprofit. And we, we are actually re-injecting all the, so all the profits made by the nonprofit are being redirected into a community fund, which is used to, um, to leverage actually uh, uh, funds that are, uh, whether it's like uh, provincial or, or federal funds that are available or programs and used to leverage that. So this money, let's say we have $100,000, maybe we can get half a million dollars to create projects and these projects and these structures are also units that create revenue but are part of the nonprofit and all the the the, um, the profits are redistributed into the, co the community uh, growth funds and uh, we start this year and we have our first uh, our first uh, we call that hub like a hub and uh, it's a fulfillment center for uh, so it's a warehousing and fulfillment center for ecom small e-commerce companies so we offer like very low cost opportunities to warehouse, but also fulfill. And um, yeah, and it, it's, it's starting now, you know, and I feel like it's that kind of the, the, the reasoning behind my big picture, but it, it looks like it now is the first step. And, uh, but it, it, it looks a lot like that, you know what I mean? So yes, I have a vision, but it materializes into different shapes and different forms right now. And I love it because I'm discovering new things every year. I'm like, you know what, this is, Perfect. And I, I realign with that. You know, I, I, I add different things and it's, it's, it's beautiful. So yeah, it revolves around like without going in, in very specific details, but it really revolves around community, around empowering entrepreneurs and, 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 and engineering that, you know, building that. So there's a context and there's, uh, there's a structure, there's a framework that we can, in, in which we can uh, evolve in that. I guess, you know, that's what we're doing on you know, obviously on a personal scale with, with Epic and done by noon. Um, but yeah. Yeah. See, and see, you can, you can hear and see if you're watching the video, how that lights Dave up and how this is, oh it fuels his creativity mm -hmm. and his excitement and his passion. And that's what we all need if we're going to stay engaged and in love with our entrepreneurship. It's a great, you know, entrepreneurship. It's such a great vehicle. It's such a great, you know, when you're an entrepreneur, you can provide great solutions. It's a superpower. And when you put, you know, well-intended entrepreneurs together to work together is like, you know, like the Avengers or you know, whatever <laughs> groups they have uh, in, in comic books. But, you know, I feel like you can really make a significant impact uh, on the world, you know, and, and but the world starts with your own backyard. Exactly. And I want entrepreneurs to start looking, you know, those who say, oh, yeah, I want to impact the world. Yeah, that's great. But start with your own backyard, look into your own community and see how you can make a, an impact here. You know, and we see it here in a rural area where we have challenges that maybe big cities don't have, but we have great resources. We have great people and there's bright minds. 
you know, how can we put them together to, for the greater goods, you know? So, you know, but step number one for me, my mission right now, what fulfills me is to help entrepreneurs actually, you know, harness these superpowers and manage themselves and become actually real good, solid entrepreneurs that will play the game well for a long time. You know, that's, that's my main goal with Epic. And then there's the greater goal of, of empowering these, these groups of entrepreneurs. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Dave, so much for being with us today and sharing all of your ideas and your wisdom. And thank you, listener, for listening. And you are on a, we are on a mission to be in 50 countries and we're only in the 20s. So I oh. need you to share, everybody out there, share the podcast with somebody in a country that I, you know could already be on the list, but that's okay. <laughs> there you go. And we're and, looking, uh, we're, we're looking for FX certified coaches on all continents, including Antarctica. So excellent. <laughs> that'll be the, the, to me that that'll be when I feel I've completely arrived as a podcaster is when we get into Antarctica. I mean, they've got, they've got to be listening to podcasts out there, right? <laughs> the two, the two scientists that are freezing their, their butts right now are might be listening to podcasts. Exactly. They need an entrepreneurial podcast. <laughs> So be, go onto the show notes, get your copy of, get, of Done by Noon. You are going to love it. It's going to change your life. And in the meantime, have a fantastic week.